but the colours are very different. It is a difficult thing. And how I got into looking at acetates 15, 20 years ago now, no, more than that, is with a couple of patients who had macular degeneration. And that's the loss of the pigment in the macula of the eye, so they lose the colour, the sense of colour and the central vision. Um, and what these two elderly ladies wanted to know is whether a product called lutein and zeaxanthin, which were carotenoids, would be a benefit for them. And so I could muscle test generally whether it was good or bad, um, but we knew nothing about acetates or anything in those days. Um, but I thought, well, they're yellow and they're orange in colour. Um, let's make up some acetates of different colours, which we got standard from print shops, and see if they actually weaken to a particular colour. And then what I could do is I could put the, uh, uh, the lutein zeaxanthin on to see if it strengthened them. And so that's how I started. And I found that, surprisingly, of the seven colours, there would always be a colour that a person would weaken to. Okay? Um, or that they may strengthen, but at least if they weaken to it, we could find out whether something actually strengthened them. Uh, and then um, a colleague in the print industry said, but Chris, th there aren't seven colours. Those are the seven colours of the rainbow or Newton's through the spectrum. There's actually only three colours that we use in the print industry and optics. And in the print industry, it's red, yellow and blue to make up all colours. Those are the colours that you, or the complementary colours that you use in your cartridge in your, in your computer printer. But it's red, green and blue are the optics of colour. And when you look this up, if you mix red, green and blue, you actually get white light, or what we would call clear light. It's not white, it's, it's clear, it's perfect light. So we know that clear light, when it goes through a prism, produces these seven colours of the rainbow. Um, so we looked, I looked this up and then I found that televisions work in three colours, red, green and blue. But the human eye was not mid-range. We've worked out what the mid-range red, green and blue were, the wavelengths. It wasn't. But the human eye sees in red, green and blue, but the red is offset towards the orange, the green more towards the yellow end of green, and the blue more towards the violet end of it. But the question was, why does that occur? How can we sort of come to some good logical reason as to why people will weaken to a colour? And what I observed in those early days is often people would close their eyes but they still weaken. And this was even more mysterious, because why would somebody, if we're looking at the cones, they wouldn't be able to see the colour by closing their eyes. There must be something affecting the skin, through the skin. And then we found it would actually weaken the person wherever you put it on the skin. Um, but if you put clothes over it, it didn't. Okay, so in other words, if you covered it over so the light didn't go through the acetate, the person wouldn't weaken. So it had to be the actual light going through. So there must be receptors in the skin which pick up a range of uh, different wavelengths. So let's stay with the eyes, first of all, with the cones, because if we start with that, then it gives you a good, good basis for her. Uh, and we know now that we have rods and cones in the eye. Rods pick up um, dim vision, not black or white, it's dim vision. And we know that the cones pick up the colour in the centre of the macula of the eye. Um, but they found that there are a third group of receptors called ops, op, melanopsin receptors. Now these are, contain melanin. Okay, and melanin is the absorber of light. This is why we have it in the skin here. So people with dark skins have high amounts of melanin. People with low melanin are white. And if you've got no melanin at all, you've got albino. But this melanin is also in the hair. Okay, in various locations in the body, and many internal organs are rich in melanin as well, particularly in the brain. So the areas like the substantia nigra are called the substantia nigra. The nigra is melanin, it's the black. And nobody really knows what it's for. It's thought to contain or attract metals and maybe act as an antioxidant. So melanin comes in different forms, as we'll see. There's different colours of it and different forms where it comes from. Okay, and we'll be looking at that, what it's made from. Uh, but we know that there are different colours pigments. And we know that when I put red on Sally, it overpowers her. Okay? But it probably doesn't overpower you. You, you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. If I put it on to Janice, Janice won't weaken to red. Now, why does she not weaken to red and you do? In other words, there's pigments in the back of your eye which are overpowered. Okay? And we know that this is genetic, just the same way that your colour of your hair and the colour of your skin. If mum and dad were pale skin, you'd probably be pale skin. If you come out dark skin, there'd be questions probably would be asked. Okay? <laughs> if you were 
uh, if mum and dad have brown hair and the child comes out with black hair or ginger hair, uh, there would be questions possibly. You could say, well, it's a throwback. <laughs> no, genetics is the always answer. Mm. But uh, the, the reality of it is these are things are inherited or genetic. Okay? So if these, these melanoreceptors, um, they don't pick up uh, outline at all. They are the things there that pick up shades okay, of light and dark. There's no outline. Okay? It's really in the peripheral vision mainly uh, that they pick up, and they pick up different shades, not of just black and white, but of colour, but not with outline. And they're very abundant in the eye and send information back um, to, the, um, um, to the hypothalamus uh, and many other areas, the uh, suprachiasmic um, area, which runs the body clock. And they now know that it's very much involved, these, uh, these receptors, to, the sh to night and day and, and work with circadian rhythms. But, um, no, where were we? So the information, <laughs> the information going into the eyes from the melano, uh, melanoopsin receptors doesn't see outline at all. It sees shades of it. And this appears to be a third type of receptor cell coming in. And its main function appears to be the, re the reflex closing of the eye. So when you shine a bright light into the eye, the pupillary light reflex, the pupil gets smaller, doesn't it? Okay, which is what you have. Now, people, when they start getting older, they don't respond to the light in that way, and so you can't see close up because the pupil should constrict as you get older. And this is what happens when you get to, what is it, 45, 50, something like that, you start to get what's called the long arm syndrome, don't you? <laughs> so you can't read it here, so it goes there, and then it's there. And then the writing's too small to be able to read it in the first place, okay? So you either get uh, a magnifying glass or, or glasses. And what most people do find, though, is if they take that outside in the bright light, okay, you can read it. And why is that? Because the intensity of the light hits the melanin receptors that you've got left okay, and produces the pupillary light reflex. Okay? Now, it would appear that this melanoreceptors contain the different forms of melanin, which is inherited or genetic. So some people will have ones which have certain compositions called eumelanin and some pheomelatin melanin, as we'll see. And it's probably those receptors, genetically, which are then overpowered with the colour. Okay? So that's what happens with Sally. So when you put the red on her, she doesn't like red. Although we call her a red, red's a bad colour for you. Okay? The good colour for you is the complementary colour, isn't it? Okay? So this is well documented in the... Uh, on, uh, if you go through the scientific literature, about these receptors as a third receptor in the eye. And it makes sense that that is probably what's happening when you put different colours on a person, because they're now discovering those receptors are in other tissues as well. And they studied mainly birds and they studied mainly reptiles. They haven't done much work with humans, but they're now coming to the conclusion that light is very important to people. And that certain light is very healing. And blue light is one of those. That mid-range mid -range blue can actually help people to counteract infections. It actually stimulates the immune system. Hey, hey, we've been saying this for a long time, that different colours help people to heal them of different emotional and, and physical problems. So there's more and more research coming out there if you start to look for it, um, to give it some form of basis to say, well, actually, for the patient who says, well, why does that work? I don't understand that. Or a practitioner say, well, give me the scientific evidence. And that's why we put it all in the book. OK, so that one's for your patient. <laughs> who ask too many questions, <laughs> okay. and that one's for the practitioner. Okay. So it at least gives you some, some scientific background to why people weaken to a particular colour. And what during the years I found is that, um, that particular aspects of these colours, they form into patterns of the constitution. And now we know for sure what it is, it's genetic. Okay. And there appears to be three clear, distinct genetic types of people. And these fall into roughly body height of how tall a person. So you've got tall people, medium-sized people, and shorter people, all right? And within a centimetre or an inch, it's practically always in that, those divisions. So skeletal maturity occurs with girls a little earlier, about 17, with males probably 18, 19. So you will find if you've got a tall person to treat, uh, they should be a green. Okay, anybody over, a man over five or eight should be a green, okay? Um, somebody, a man, five foot six to five foot eight, could be a red, and below five foot six, he's probably a blue. OK? 
Okay. And girls will be slightly smaller, you know, five foot five um, and less will be blue, five foot five to five foot seven will be red, five foot seven and above. Give or take an inch, you know, or two. But occasionally you do get a tall blue one. You know. I've got somebody that I treat remotely or surrogate wise in New Zealand. Um, and there's two brothers, and they're both very seriously ill, neurological problems, I believe, and they both showed to being blue. And the wife said, this is impossible, because I watched your videos, uh, on a, and, you know, they're very tall. And I th but every time they show up to being blue. But, of course, now, when we've done the cardiography remotely, guess what they show to? Mercury, okay? And this is what's blocking it. And they show to alpha lipoic acid. So once we clear the mercury out, then they will probably change to being green or whatever <laughs> colour they are, right? So it's actually put the brake on the whole thing with it. So it is difficult sometimes to find out the cause with these people, okay? So let's have a quick look what the characteristics are. We looked um, at these in detail um, during the cancer seminars because one thing I've observed and... Uh, I haven't had anybody to uh, refute that yet, is that all cancer cases are blue. It does not mean that all blue people get cancer. So that's just a model here. We took this one out, obviously, of the patient's handbook. The cone is overstimulated by or overpowered by the color, which changes the excitation rate in the hypothalamus, which then affects the pons and the medullary reticular formation affects the lateral cell column, superspinal gamma motor neurons, and weakening on the manual muscle test. So, so that if you read this, you'll see the sort of science behind what the melanopsin-containing ganglion cells are all about. Now, we'll come back to the black. So let's have a look at um, the red. The red will be a particularly interesting case um, where we looked extensively at the blue person with the cancer. Uh, the red will be interesting because the next module that we're going to do, we're going to concentrate mainly on the heart. So we'll be looking not just at red people because green people have heart attacks and things as well, uh, and blue people can. But reds are the ones who are more predisposed to it. So we know that the red body types are governed by their thyroid gland. So red people like Sally, who's really a red, everything really is related to the thyroid. And the thyroid runs the metabolic rate. So when it's running normally, the people tend to be th on the thinner side. When obviously it doesn't run normally, then they gain weight in a particular way. So the high thyroid hormones are the ones that regulate them. And they've usually got long, thin bones, as you'd expect. And when you look at the hands, and I don't know with Sally or yours, uh, do you get knuckles on them? Sometimes you can see visibly beginning of little knuckles on the, on the uh, interphalangeal joints there. Not Perhaps not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the nails are hard and half moons are pronounced when the thyroid is working. When it stops working or slows down, often the half moons disappear. Okay, I have lots of eyebrows. Is that true with you? Or do you pluck them? It's a meeting in the middle above the nose, but most women take it. Fine hair, small white teeth. They have a tendency to arthritis and skin problems. The thyroid is stimulated by anything that increases or raises their blood glucose. They do best on an early to bed and early to rise. Is that you? Uh, early to bed, early to rise? Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. They, like to be because they've got a fast metabolism. Um, and they crave anything, um, chocolate, juices, alcohol. Now you can crave the alcohol, you see, which you couldn't have when you were blown. They do best on early to bed and early to rise. And breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Yes. Okay. You see, she's got the characteristics of the red but she's been living a false artificial life all these years. Okay. Okay. Generally do best on a high protein, moderate fat and low carb diet, making them natural carnivores. Is that right? You're more of a carnivore? Yeah, I, I actually have high fat. Yeah. Fat. Yeah, so okay. Low carbohydrate and protein. Um, the only thing they should avoid really on that section is broccoli because it contains cyanide, thiocyanides, which inhibit thyroid function. Health risks, the main cardiovascular, due to the genetic enzyme defects. So we, when we look at um, the heart tomorrow in detail, we'll look at muscular disorders of the actual heart itself, which would include the muscle of the um, myocardium and the valves. And this would be the majority. 
and then you've got your so-called genetic disorders, which are your neurological problems. These are when the heart beats too fast, too slow, or irregularly. Okay, so they're more the genetic ones, which are neurological or affect the nervous system. Okay, so they have a tendency to high levels of homocysteine. Now, homocysteine, again, we'll talk about later on, um, is a weakener of collagen. So it has many um, properties, good and bad, um, but one of the things it does is it inhibits the final lysyl oxidase enzyme in the production of collagen, which means collagen is like the glue that holds our body together, including the blood vessels. So it actually weakens the, the wall of the blood vessels. Uh, and this is why it makes them more prone to cardiovascular problems. Now, sometimes if I tested uh, Sally now, did you have breakfast here, Sally? Yes. Yeah, have you had a breakfast today? Yeah, me too. I've had lots of You've had lots? Yeah, I've had food all different at different times. Okay, uh, have you eaten any eggs? Today, no. No, okay. Now, eggs are a rich source of methionine, aren't they, and cysteine. And the reason for that is that homocysteine is made from methionine en route to making cysteine, isn't it? So what we do and what they found is that at least 25% more people will show positive to homocysteine if you load the homocysteine with methionine. So what we've done here in the, the little packs and things for testing, we've called it methionine-loaded homocysteine. Okay? So in other words, instead of giving the person 500 milligrams or a gram of methionine an hour or so before you do the test, you just load it on the vial. Okay? And you're more likely to pick it out with that than just methionine on its own, uh, than just homocysteine on its own. Because she hasn't eaten anything, you see, if I test her with the homocysteine, she may not show that it's going to be very high at the moment. But give her a high-protein meal, particularly with a lot of cysteine, like eggs, she could then weaken to the homocysteine, you see? So if you test with a, with a methionine-loaded homocysteine, you're more likely to pick it out, all right? So you can do that. If you've got a simulator yourself, you can make your own, you can change your, just increase the loading if you like, put the methionine into the homocysteine vial. We'll always do any vials that you want, but if you've already got kits with that, then that's sort of how you increase it. So uh, high homocysteine will lead to increased cardiovascular factors, uh, usually APOE4 lipoprotein allele, which gives them poor removal of cholesterol fragments and elimination of toxic metals, especially aluminium in the red person. It gives them a propensity to convert glucose into triglycerides, in other words, into fats, and cholesterol as their thyroids become hypoactive. So it doesn't spin the Krebs cycle. The thing about the thyroid is it spins the rate of the Krebs cycle. So if you're slow, the acetyl-CoA, which is the substrate to the Krebs cycle, will get deviated into making triglycerides and cholesterol. So the vast majority of people with high cholesterols, high triglycerides, are th underactive thyroids. Uh, Ample intake of iodine is required, not only for their thyroid glands, but also for their immune system. And we know that iodine also works well on estradiol, estro and estriol balance within the hormones, within the female hormones. So iodine has three things. So if a person shows up to iodine, then it's a very, very good idea to check the systems. So this person would be deficient in either T1, T2, or T4. Okay, so in other words, they're not making thyroxine. So it could be T1, T2, and two twos make four, okay? Um, so that in other words, they're gonna be deficient. If they're deficient in T4, they're probably gonna be deficient in T2 or t possibly T1, okay? Now, we do make T3 in the thyroid gland from T1 and T2. Two and one makes three. But we can also make three, if you remember, from four minus one, okay? So the deiodinase enzyme, which is a selenium zinc copper dependent enzyme, but I, if a person shows to iodine, check the thyroid, especially a red person. Okay, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that they need iodine. Okay? But iodine also works on the immune system. That's why we put iodine, you paint it on when you cut yourself, because it's an antiseptic. And it's one of the killing chemicals that the neutrophils produce. And also the balance of the estradiol and estrone to keep those two down in comparison to the estriol. So to get the balance in the hormones in both males and females, you should make sure that the estradiol and estrone together is lower than the estriol ratio. And to do that, the most common nutrient to do that is iodine. Now iodine comes principally from the sea. So what other sources of iodine can you think about apart from seaweed? Black walnut. Black walnut, yes. 
Okay, so black walnut, you know, from the, coming up to the walnut season now, if you pick the walnut and it's black and it will stain your hand, and that's what stains wood to make it posh, to make it look like wal wa uh, walnut wood. Okay, that's iodine. That's what stains your hand. Okay, so that's a very good source. What? White dead nettle. Yes, that's an old one, isn't it? Yes. Okay. One other nice one, which is um, I'm finding comes up quite a lot now, is rosemary. Rosemary. That's why it's that dark when you get the tincture. Rosemary tincture mm. is a dark, and that's got very rich in iodine as well. So um, bladderwrack is a seaweed. Kelp. You know, all these families are all seaweed. And interestingly, sometimes one type of iodine will show, but not others. And this is always a little bit difficult to determine exactly when a person doesn't strengthen to a particular nutrient. You can't 100% say that the person doesn't need it. And what we found before is like zinc. There were 10 different forms of zinc which we used to use. Um, but now by merging two together and putting the citric acid, we find we, we make sure we don't miss any zincs then. It's the optimal. But iodine, I still haven't mastered the best source of iodine. Because sometimes it's the concentrated one from seaweed, sometimes it's the kelp, um, sometimes it's the, the iodides, the potassium or the magnesium iodide are the only thing that show. Um, whereas the iodines, you know, from organic iodines from the seaweed, contain ammonium chloride, uh, ammonium iodide as well. And sometimes that one seems to work better. Um, and sometimes it's um, uh, black walnut uh, is the only thing. So when a person shows to black walnut, it's not only parasites. You know, it could be the iodine, and it could be the iodine stimulates the immune system to kill the parasites anyway. All right. So food intolerances, we know they're intolerant to wheat, and particularly whole wheat products. This is probably due to both reacting to the lectin in the wheat bran, and also the rancid fatty acids present in non-freshly me milled wheat. And I think the latter, I'm coming around to thinking, is the more reason. We were always sort of led to believe 10 years ago it was the lectin, which was the sensitivity we read people, uh, the N-acetyl galactosamine. But I think it is, I think it's the rancicity that they say, which is why white flour products are okay, okay? Because there's no germ in them, okay? And if there's no germ in them, there's no oils, there's no vitamin E, there's nothing for the next generation of plant, okay? The germ is the, the seed, okay? The, the white flour that you get is the endosperm, is the starch. That's the food for the growing plant. Okay, so when you put the seed in, uh, into the ground, and it starts to sprout, it uses the wheat, uh, the, the, uh, the white flour part, the starch. Okay? But the real nutrient is in the germ. Okay? Now, the, the bran contains all your vitamins. It contains vitamin B1, B2, B3, B4. And we'll talk a bit about B4, adenine, because this is very important for the conduction of the heart fibers. Uh, B6, um, it contains most of the most of the vitamin B's are in the bran. Okay, now the bran acts as a seal to preserve the grain. Okay, that's its function. It's like an eggshell to preserve the egg. The egg is the new generation of the chick, and that's why that bran is impervious to air. It will not oxidize the germ. The germ is as fresh in there after five thousand years. They found. Take it out the pyramid, and it will grow. Amazing. There was no oxidation. Okay, as soon as they took the bran off and the outer husk, and then it will be oxidized, okay? And then once you've milled that, between one week and four weeks, and it's had it, okay? So remember, if you are red, you can probably tolerate white flour products, probably, better than whole grain, okay? But you have no value at all. You've got pure starch, and if you're gonna burn that starch, you've got to pump it through the Krebs cycle, which needs all the bees, okay? So they're like empty calories. So once you start taking white flour products in, you will not only not have bees coming in, but you'll deprive your body of the bees. Okay, do you see what I mean? Because if you've got to burn it, where are you going to get your bees from? You've got to take it from somewhere else, haven't you? Okay, so every time you have white, I don't want to make you feel guilty or anything later on when you have your sandwiches and things, you will actually deprive your body. Not just not get it, but you will deprive it. When you have your, and you're good as gold, and you say, no, I'll have brown bread, or even wholemeal bread, you'll say, I'm good. But what you'll get in that is your bees, which is great. But you get oxidized oils, it's rancid, rancid fats. 
The oils, the wheat germ oil there, has lost its E because that's been used to preserve the oil within the wheat germ and it's gone rancid. And that is ten times worse for you than eating the white. So you shouldn't feel guilty when they come around with the white bread when you go to the restaurant. Have the white bread and don't touch the whole meal. The whole meal is deadly stuff. Okay? Mm -hmm. The only whole meal to touch is freshly milled. Okay? And if you have freshly milled, every town and every village a hundred years ago had a mill. You know, everywhere had windmills or watermills. And you took your wheat or you brought it to the mill. Okay? And you brought it back again. And your mum would make all the bread and the pastries and things there. We actually made surprising enough the other week, uh, a whole meal freshly ground pizza. And it was lovely, even the kids said, this is nice. And I thought they'd turn their nose up completely at this. Because I made it before with brown flour and spelt flour, and it's horrible. You know, it's real hard. But you make it freshly ground, and it's moist, it's got the wheat germ oil and so on in it. And it's beautiful. So it's all the difference. Now if you want to mill your own, I'll tell you where you can buy the grain. Okay? You've got no excuse now. It doesn't take very long. Okay? But you need the right equipment. Okay? You need a Vitamix or a Kenwood chef that has an attachment for me here. Or Sam has a box. Don't you, Sam? Tell us about your box. Where did you get the stone mill from? Uh, Germany. In Germany, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the Germans do a lot of good products in, in that way, as far as... Um, yeah. Uh, so y you think how strong you got, though, the exercise. And you were doing it while you were watching television, like you were telling me. So you think of the exercise for the muscles there. Fantastic. Okay. He earned his bread by the time he worked for an hour and a half tonight. <laughs> but that's what people did years ago, otherwise, wasn't it? Yeah. And interesting, apparently, the Canadian Army during the Second World, World War, gave everybody wheat, um, <coughs> the grains of it, to keep in their wallets. And the reason for this is if you put wheat um, grains onto blotting paper there's some other, and wet it, they'll sprout. And sprouted grains are very, very rich in vitamin C and it stops scurvy. Yes. So it's a better cure of scurvy than limes and lemons, in fact, the amount of vitamin C. So as, this, as the grain grows, that endosperm, the white stuff, the white starch, is converted into vitamins and proteins. Okay? So it actually increases the, in the content. So the sprouting wheat is even better. Okay? So not only do you now have your kilogram there, <laughs> but you actually try and, have you ever tried soaking it and see if you get it to sprout first of all? Okay. The trouble is it's wet by that time and then you've got to allow it to dry and all sorts of... So, anyway. So, food intolerances. So, this is the, the wheat story. But we will go on a bit about it because of what Pottinger found, you know, with the processed food. And you'll find all these experts, Weston Price, McCarrison, etc., all said the same thing. It's when you refine bread, you don't get your vitamins and your minerals and things in there. When you eat cooked meat and when you pasteurize the milk, Okay? You destroy a lot of the enzymes and the proteins and the vitamins and things, which help the person to build you know, the change in the calcium. And sugar, you know, nothing wrong they found with raw sugar, raw cane sugar. So remember, it's raw cane sugar. That's what you need to get. Okay? And it's beautiful. Nobody knows the difference. Okay? But you never see it in shops. Okay? You have to specialise health food stores Rapidura. with it. Rapadura. What? Rapadura. Right. That's the evaporated cane juice. Okay. You can use the cane juice, but w if you just use the sugar, and then you can put the sugar into whatever you want to put sugar in. And then you don't feel bad about putting sugar in. And because it tastes sugary, um, you know, it's reasonably sweet, um, but you know you're getting all the vitamins and the uh, minerals in, in raw cane sugar are enormous. Okay. Um, emotions. They tend to have unconscious emotions. Do you remember we talked about the three main love emotions? And red people, unconsciously, they're not conscious necessarily in their life of this, uh, don't feel lovable. That's usually, they don't have the same self-esteem. Um, so they don't feel that they're worthy of love. Okay? Now this is a subconscious emotion, and you may want to not want to do this directly with the patients. But you will find that if you test Sally, and we won't test her necessarily unless she wants us to do that, and she says, I am lovable. Okay? She can say, I'm loving, and I'm loved, and she stays strong. Um, but I am lovable, and they tend to go weak. Could we do that, Sally? Is that all right? Just to, as a demo there. Uh, 
Yeah, we'll we have a look at the orders in a minute. Yeah, just pop yourself down on your Mac. Ah, right, okay. So we don't need to even worry which side because this is a universal response, right and left brain. It's not even anything to do with your brain. You're hearing it consciously, but it's an emotion. Okay, so what I want you to say is, I am loved. I am loved. I am loving. I am loving. I am lovable. I am lovable. Interesting, isn't it? I am lovable. I am lovable. <laughs> okay, so we'll find the remedy for that to make you more lovable <laughs> later on. Okay. So what um, happens that everybody who's red, green or blue will weaken to one of those three statements. And red people is always lovable. And basically, on an unconscious level, they don't feel lovable, that they're worthy of love, for, for whatever reason. I don't know why. Okay. And they don't know. This is the trouble. They don't know either, but they all weak at that. So it's a life type of psychological reversal, because they are lovable. But they don't feel that they are. Okay. And so we need to look at the relationship of the emotions later on, in how we can treat those to help that person feel better within themselves. Okay. So. There's the body type, long thing and fingers, palms equal length, overall appearance, lean. Uh, diet. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, as we said. High protein, moderate fats, low carbs. Uh, avoid the whole wheat um, and avoid broccoli. But cabbage is okay, you'll be glad to know. <laughs> you don't? No. Yeah, broccoli, those cruciferous vegetables, you know, uh, or the broccoli particularly, has thiocyanides in which can inhibit the, uh, you see, thiocyanides are really halogens which can um, displace iodine. So it's the same with fluoride um, and high chlorine in there. Sorry? Um, I wouldn't want to eat it raw anyway. Um, certainly when you cook broccoli for a few minutes, it's, it's pretty good for everybody who's not red. If you cook it for 10 minutes, it doesn't strengthen anybody. Huh? Okay. No, <laughs> two, two to three minutes is enough. Okay. Once you, once you do it for longer than that, all those good things in broccoli just does it go into the water. The water's great, but not the broccoli. Okay. okay, so what we found by putting the red acetate over, let's say Sally is there, is she will strengthen to vitamin B2. Now, later on tomorrow, you'll learn what vitamin B2 does. It's a vasodilator. There's lots of properties of B2, um, but it's primarily is a vasodilator, and this is very important for the heart. Okay, so this is number one point. B6, what did we find first of all with Sally? B6 showed up there. Folic acid, B12, um, um, and you notice those are all homocysteine, okay? Um, it, things that affect homocysteine. Vitamin C, we'll see the role of vitamin C in homocysteine, and the phospholipid, builder inositol shows here. On the minerals, we have iodine, as you'd expect, or iodides, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, especially for the thyroid conversion there, silica for the, for the collagen, hands, knees, and things, but again for the blood vessels, isn't it? Remember, silica is the formation of collagen, and zinc, but everybody shows the zinc, because zinc is practically universal. Should be taken in water one to three times a day with meals. <laughs> Usually it's once a day. Um, sometimes more. Inositol is a phospholipid, uh, in what's called a lipotrophic factor, it helps you to break fats down. Okay, it turns them into phosphatidyl inositol, just in the same way with greens as we see, they need choline. Okay, these are very important substances, phospholipids, to reduce um, high cholesterol and triglycerides. Okay, so, oils. What we know is that red people need a blend of oils. They work very, very well on omega-3, 6, and 9, the blend of that. So flaxseed oil, which is much higher in, in omega-3. Hemp, which is a nice even third omega-3 and omega-6. Olive oil, which is mostly omega-9. And lucky things need pumpkin seed oil, which is just lovely for everything. All oil oils must be organic, as we said. Cold-pressed, um, and everything is cold-pressed in our oils. Um, but the olive is always cold pressed anyway, and taken with the evening meal. This is very important because that's when you produce maximum amount of lipase. Okay? Never cook with any of these oils. Okay? And this is the critical thing. So what should she cook with? Not olive oil. 
Okay. So what else could she cook with? Butter, Butter yeah. I wouldn't... What? Coconut. Coconut or sunflower. Yeah, sunflower is a pretty universal, useless oil. Okay? <laughs> and it's great. Nobody strengthens the sunflower oil, really, which makes it perfect for cooking. Because when you change that sunflower and you oxidise it and you maybe convert it into trans fats, you don't take it up. Okay? But the red person, if they cook with olive oil and they turn it into a, they oxidise it and take it, they will take it up because their body says, I like olive oil. So it's going to take it up and put it into the various fats. So they should never cook with hemp, which is too good. But supermarkets sell it as good oil, don't they, for cooking. It's called good oil. Flax, well, you wouldn't want to cook with flax anyway. That would be, you know. Uh, and, but pumpkin is, again, you wouldn't want to cook with pumpkin. Okay? So she should use sunflower, maybe coconut, uh, but any oil, but not olive. Right? So you shouldn't cook with But it's a lovely oil for you to use. Okay? So herbs and spices, coriander, good detoxifier of metals, Sally. Okay? Otherwise known as cilantro. So oregano, rosemary. See where they come up? Black walnut. Okay? See all our friends to detoxify. All rich here in iodine, the rosemary and the black one, all good detoxifiers, are particularly of, of metals. So a nice cup of tea, but it's a herbal one and spice that you're going to be having. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> it likes you. That was when you were a blue person. Now you'll like it, because you're a red. Don't like it on pizza. <laughs> okay, right, spices. Cumin, fenugreek, ginger and mace, okay? Ginger's really nice, it's a heating one. The others are good for the gut, fenugreek's very good for the gut, um, and mace. Now, what's interesting about these four is they're very good for red people. Uh, as, a, as a drink with the herbs, you can mix, you know, the mixture of herbs and spices and have it as a tea, and it's good to maintain a regular detoxification of metals and things. But what we've traditionally done is to use tinctures when you want to get something inside the body and powders when you want to get it inside the gut, okay? And if you use the mixture of these, which we now call a red spice mix, it's great on parasites. They hate this, okay? They don't mind the tincture because the tincture is absorbed in the higher part of the duodenum, but the spice isn't. And you shove a whole load of ginger, cumin, fenugreek and mace down there and they get the hell out of it. Okay. Sam, you're, you're enjoying what we're doing. We've had some good results with it, haven't we? So, take uh, difficult parasites. I've had one case which it hasn't worked with. She's a blue. We tried chili and mixing them, and it just about does a holding operation on her. But she's very difficult, got uh, very stubborn trematodes. But in a lot of the cases, you know, it works better than almost anything else when you can't find ones. And you tried on yours, wormwood, didn't you, and uh, the usual sort of things, and it didn't touch it. So think of spices, that will be the natural way. That's what they do in the East, they use spices to um, not only spice the food up, to give it flavour, but they're preservers. Um, so they actually preserve the meat and they're antimicrobial. So that would be the, for the red person. So herbs and spices should be again more organic, we do them as a beverage mixed, but we're now doing this as capsules, and uh, as Clive said, we're now doing capsules. And obviously all our uh, capsules are, are veggie caps, so there's no need to worry about any beef gelatin or anything in there. Okay. Yeah? Sort of like, like That's walnuts. walnuts. Now, not the black walnut. The black walnut tincture is different from the walnut itself. So the walnut uh, will be coming along shortly, you know, once the, another couple of weeks and the walnuts will be dropping out, and you may get them before the squirrels. Okay. <laughs> but what a season, have you noticed? How how much the trees are just laden, aren't they? Amazing. Walnut trees, conker trees, horse chestnuts, they're just absolutely laden with fruit this year. So there's our mixture of the, uh, the red oils, the uh, uh, red vitamin mineral mix, and the red herbs and spices. And now we do the spices as capsules, uh, mainly for parasites. Weight gain, everything to do with decreased thyroid, so we gain weight. Thick neck, um, this is the thing, bigger build on the body, bigger upper arms and upper legs, but normal, if you remember, on the lower arms and the lower legs. They're normal, the weight doesn't go on there. Everything else they get bigger with. Right, greens, we can race through this now, you've got the gist of it. Greens are the taller, they're the Scandinavians, if you like, which we find the taller one. They're run by their adrenal cortex, okay? So greens 
tend to be taller, uh, they tend to be muscular, everything's to do with muscles there, and they live on their adrenals, so they go, 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 go. Okay? So that means we like to have a good rest and get up late and go to bed late. Okay? So we're the party goers. Don't really marry a red, <laughs> no. because it's the opposites, you know. But um, we tend to go, 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 and then bang, drop. Okay? <laughs> now, it's interesting why we go pop. <laughs> because nobody can really predict when someone goes pop very easily. But there is a way of finding that, we find, by looking at the heart. Okay? So they have found with cattle, they fed cattle a vitamin E deficient diet. And the majority of the cattle, after six months, dropped dead, for no reason at all. And they found that the vitamin E deficiency causes necrosis of the heart muscle. So the heart literally bursts, and that's what a deficiency of vitamin E does. So now you see what vitamin E does in the diet. Where do you get your vitamin E from? Wheat germ. Wheat germ is a good source, yes. But what wheat germ do you ever take in your diet that isn't rancid already? You know, it could be years old, that, that wheat germ, by the time you get it. If you're a good girl and you have your whole meal, but are you doing any good by having a whole meal? Every vegetable, every cereal, is either devoid of wheat germ, or the germ of it, or is rancid. In the process, it's been heated in the very process of doing it. So it's a miracle that we get oil, that we get E at all. The only way you'll get your oils, your E, is through good oils. And so the good raw, cold-pressed oils, kept in dark jars like we do, is a good source of E, with the best being wheat germ, as you say. I'll just finish this off, and then we'll go out to lunch. So. We have good, strong immune system. I say we because I'm a green. Um, the adrenal cortex regulates water retention, regulates blood sugar, the immune system, and the sex hormones. They're generally very strongly built uh, on the taller side of, uh, our hands are big, square, tubular fingers, great for kneading bread. Okay, absolutely fantastic uh, for kneading bread. Good resistance disease, get well quickly, work hard, play hard along with the adrenal glands. The adrenals are stimulated by sodium and cholesterol, and so tend to have a craving towards salty things, if you don't watch it, because this uh, increases our uh, water um, and cholesterol. So they crave salt and salty foods and, and greasy foods like crisps and chips. They get stronger and stronger as the day progresses, and those who stimulate their adrenals tend to drink alcohol in the evenings to relax. It's a good excuse, isn't it? <laughs> They're hardworking, intelligent. Do you notice that? <laughs> what? Jack eats potatoes, yeah. That's one of the things greens can't have. Okay, intelligent and positive, but very chemically sensitive. Okay, so we weren't really born to be in this century. Temperament can be explosive. If you push them, push them, push them, but you've got to push them a lot. Late to bed and late to rise is the norm.